All right, welcome to our uh, rhetoric and writing lecture for week six of English 101. And this is the lecture where we focus on, again, the rhetoric and the writing part versus the reading or just the overview lecture. So let's take a look um, at what we're going to do this week. You can see from this image up here, this says logical fallacies. And that's one of the main things we're going to cover. We're going to talk a little bit about essay three again and then mainly cover uh, logical fallacies. And that's always I'm going to try this week to get through this as quick as I can to make this video fairly brief. Um, so essay assignment three, again, it's a rough draft. It's due at the end of week six of the class. And remember, we're looking at the short story by Juno Diaz, and I want you to pay particular t attention to what you believe the writer is trying to say about ambition and social mobility in America. Uh, is he painting an optimistic or pessimistic or neutral picture of ambition and social mobility? Because I do think he's, you know, maybe subconsciously, but it seems like there's a lot in the story that relates to those themes for me anyway, when I read it. Um, and, you know, again, when you when you do think about the story, then you're going to summarize it. We talked about this in the reading uh, lecture for this week, but, um, you know, make sure, or the overview rather, make sure you um, try to use some ideas from Diaz's story, just enough to show that you understand the story and what, what it's saying. And then you're writing for this friend or family member who maybe is not ambitious enough or you believe is too ambitious. So just a reminder about the story again. And as always, let me know if you have questions about it. Uh, assume your reader's not familiar with your writing assignment. That's another important thing I just almost forgot to mention um, because that's the whole point of the summer. You're showing your understanding of the story. But again, to do that, you kind of have to assume you're not writing just for me um, because I'm obviously familiar with the story and think about how you could explain the story to someone who's never read it as briefly as possible. You don't want to go on and on about it, but you just want to say enough. And then it's your job to convince uh, your, your audience, whoever it is, whoever you choose, to be your audience, um, to be either more ambitious or a little less. All right, so we are going to talk about logical fallacies. And so the idea of, uh, you know, using um, persuasion is, is a big part of something we've already started to talk about using, remember we talked about ethos and pathos and logos, these different ways you can, uh, methods of persuasion, different, different ways you can appeal to people and persuade them. But when you cross the line just a little bit and go beyond just logical argument, that's when you go into uh, logical fallacies, which are basically again considered errors in reasoning. And um, we want to avoid these. So that, I'll say that right away before I go too far. The focus of this is I'm teaching something that I want you to be aware of. If you see it in somebody else's writing, especially stuff that we're reading for class uh, or you're reading in another class, uh, do they make a fallacy? Because usually that means they have not a really strong argument. So the same thing is true when writing. If I'm reading your paper and I see a logical fallacy, then I'm thinking, oh, maybe they don't have a strong argument. So it kind of damages what's called our ethos, which is being able to trust us uh, as, a, as, a, as a good source. So page 35 to 37 in the Harbor Essentials book, you'll find a little more detail than I'm going to go into, but I'm going to go over some of these quickly. So let's look at them. And then at the end of the video, if you can, if you get to the end of the video, I'm going to kind of give you a little quiz over them and see if you can recognize an example of them. The first one, we're going to look at eight. So I know it's quite a lot, but let's, I'll see if I can go through them fairly quick. Uh, it's called a non sequitur. Now this comes from Latin as a lot of our uh, rhetorical terms and ideas come from Latin or Greek, usually, you know, ancient Rome and ancient Greece. Uh, it does not follow. In other words, we make a connection where there's really no connection. And, you know, just because the first part of a statement is true, we kind of assume that then that second part is true, but it, it's not always that way. So for example, this is a very normal thing that somebody might say, Heather is married and will start a family soon. And you might think, well, there's not really any problem with that. It's, you know, it's probability could be higher if because she's married, she'll have children. Um, but if we assume that that second part is true, you know, Heather is married and she will start a family soon. There are instances where that could cause a problem. If she was in a job interview, let's say, and somebody discriminated against her thinking, well, she's going to be very busy having children, doing all these things. And so she might not be able to focus on the job. That's a logical fallacy and also could be illegal, I guess, if that was said, uh, you know, in a job interview or something, obviously, you know. But again, this is where a fallacy like this, it doesn't seem like any problem, but it can cause miscommunication. It could even cause somebody to be harmed by not getting a job or something. Um, so it's, it's that, and, you know, it's two things. We're connecting them, but they're not necessarily connected. Here's a more extreme example uh, of a logical fallacy. If you can see this down here at the bottom right of your screen, I really like the movie Elf. It's so funny. I love spaghetti. Let's go get some spaghetti. That's a more extreme example because it's like non sequitur is kind of like you have this idea and it doesn't really connect with the other one. 
This one's a little more subtle. In real life, it's often subtle like that. But here's an extreme example to make the point. There's no connection between the movie Elf is funny. Maybe they ate spaghetti in the movie at some point, And then so I'm going to go eat spaghetti. It doesn't really connect. So non sequitur, it doesn't follow or it doesn't connect. But we make a connection there. That's our first one. Remember, we have a few here. Ad hominem. This, I think, is a very simple one to understand. And it's basically a personal attack. So ad hominem is Latin for toward the man, toward the human is what I think it really looks more like, toward the person, hominem. But um, so down here, this, this, uh, this uh, well, let's look at the example first. With his penchant for expensive haircuts, this guy likes to get expensive haircuts. That means he can't relate to common people. So he's a bad candidate for president or, or senator, whatever, whatever this example comes from. But um, it doesn't really make any sense. That's illogical. But if somebody likes expensive haircuts that may say something about they like nice things expensive things but does that really mean they're not a good candidate here's an extreme kind of silly example right uh no your face is a logical fallacy right so it, you know basically commenting on someone's appearance is is a ad hominem you're attacking them personally and, and we see this all the time kind of bullying behaviors and stuff we see it with politicians we see it in in on television shows different places uh, and it's it's a logical fallacy. It works. That there's nothing, I'm not saying these don't work because you can use these to your advantage. But it's kind of like if you're in a fight and there were rules and you broke the rules, it works. You win. But, you know, like a boxing match, you'd probably be in trouble for that. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, toward the man is an attack on the person. That's the second one. Third one, bandwagon. So this is just basically an appeal that says everyone's doing it. You should do it, too. And um, that's everyone texts while driving, so I do too. So that dis you know, disregards the fact that that might be dangerous, uh, but just because everyone does something doesn't mean that it's a good idea. And you guys have probably all heard that before. Uh, I know from a parent when I was young, I would say, oh, there's this party Saturday night, I'm going to go, and it's, you know, whatever. And my parents would say, uh, I don't think, why, why are you going? Well, I'm, everybody's going. Well, if everybody was jumping off a cliff, would you? I, well, probably, but, and that's the, the fallacy, right? Everyone's doing it. McDonald's. Advertising does this a lot, right? I think the whole idea of over 99 billion served or however many served, um, it's sort of, it's kind of a bandwagon thing. You should be eating McDonald's hamburgers too, because everybody does. Um, we may, re we may eat them for all kinds of reasons. We may not like the taste, but, uh, this is kind of a fallacy because it's just saying you should do it because everyone's doing it. So that's a bandwagon fallacy. And by the way, these will be on one of our quizzes. Um, so if you're watching this, um, you know, you can always go back and look at the video or take notes before you do the quiz, but uh, there will be some where I ask you to recognize uh, logical fallacies in the quizzes because I think it's an important thing to be able to do to just be able to figure out if you can believe and trust what you're reading, but also to improve your own uh, uh, argument skills, argumentation skills when you're writing an argument. Uh, this foul, uh, equivocation. So it, it looks like the word equal to me when I see this one, right? Equal, equivocation. It relies on the use of one word or concept in two different ways. So we take something that actually could mean different things and we we um, we use it uh, um, in a way that misleads. So let's look at this example. Today's students are illiterate. So here's our concept, illiterate. Now, if you look that up in the dictionary, it is going to say something like cannot read and write uh, well so or at all. So they do not know the characters in Shakespeare's plays. So you see how we made two things equal that are not equal. Not knowing the characters in Shakespeare's plays might mean you're not um, cultured in terms of Shakespeare, you know, but it doesn't mean you're illiterate. You can be highly literate and not know anything about Shakespeare. First of all, it could be a you could have grown up in a different culture where Shakespeare wasn't very taught, you know, in high school or anything. But uh, I don't know all the characters in Shakespeare's plays, but I don't consider myself illiterate. So um, Shakespeare's plays, not knowing about that and illiterate, two concepts. We're making them seem the same, but they're really the, they're really not. They're two totally different ideas. This is kind of a silly one uh, down here. All trees have barks. Trees have bark. Every dog barks. Therefore, every dog is a tree. So there, that's very extreme again, right? We we made a dog and a tree the same by, by using this word bark. But again, it's the idea that we're using this one word uh, and it can be used in different ways, but we're kind of making it exactly the same. So we make illiterate maybe the same. And there's lots of different ways to do these fallacies. So um, again, not teaching you how to do them, just teaching you to recognize them. But it, we, we see this a lot where somebody says, you know, people are like this. And so all people are bad, basically, right? Uh, that's that's what we're saying here, right? We're, we're making this critique 
of calling people illiterate because they don't know Shakespeare, but that's really just not the same thing. Okay, so that, I, I went on enough about that one. Let me keep going. Uh, hasty generalization, doing something, you know, quick is what hasty means. Hasty is an old fashioned word that means fast or quick. A generalization is making a judgment or conclusion about something, right? So a hasty generalization is a quick judgment. And when I say quick judgment, maybe something pops into your mind um, with the word ism at the end of it, right? Like race, ism, um, age, ism, sex, ism, you know, um, discriminating against somebody based on appearances, right? That to me is a kind of a hasty generalization. So I think this is a very valuable thing to be aware of. But again, anytime you're, you're making this quick snap judgment about something with not enough evidence, too little evidence. Um, here's an example. Ellen's a poor student because she failed her first history test. So again, teacher decides Ellen's not a good student based on one test. Um, she has a long academic career. She's in college now um, and she failed one test. Does that mean she's a poor student? I mean, you'd have to look at more information, right? You might make the judgment that she's a poor student if you looked at all of her last five years of grades or, or she's struggling or something like that, right? But to say she's a poor student based on one test is a hasty or a quick generalization. Just like, uh, and, and again, the, the reason I brought up racism, not to be political or anything, it's just because that's an example to me of a hasty generalization because you, you just basically look at someone or you know their background or something and you make all these judgments about them and you're you're you know i'm not saying you <laughs> people do that right but we do this sometimes and that's um you know again we can make a judgment somebody's older so they're probably like this somebody's younger they're probably like this male female whatever it might be but that's a kind of a hasty generalization here's another example a person's walking through a town and he meets a few polite kids seeing that Seeing that, he concludes that all the kids in the town are polite. That may or may not be true. Probably not true, right? Um, but but we just decided that based on meeting a few nice kids. Probably, I've done that before, probably. I visit someplace. I have a great experience there. One or two people are nice. And you're like, man, I really like, uh, you know, Michigan or whatever. Um, and uh, that's a hazy generalization, probably. And it's fine to say you like it, but is it is it really that everybody's great there? Or is it just I had a good experience? But again, hazy generalization, fast and then making this generalization too quickly without enough evidence. A red herring. This is when you just want people to ignore the real problem and it's what we call dodges the issue, right? This fallacy dodges the issue by drawing attention to a seemingly related, something that seems related, but it's really irrelevant. And if we can get somebody to focus on this other thing, they won't maybe think about the thing uh, that's most important. Now, um, I always say this in class when I talk with students about this fallacy, but there's, uh, I used to watch the video sometimes because I studied rhetoric of the uh, press secretaries at the White House and their job is to deflect really. I mean, somebody asks a question. I mean, there's, I mean, officially they're supposed to be answering questions, but sometimes the questions are so difficult. There's no answer that's going to satisfy the reporters. You know, that's the person who faces all the reporters and, and it doesn't matter. I don't think which president, you know, whatever Democrat, Republican or whatever, uh, that person's got a difficult job, you know, because there's always something going on in the country that they're going to ask them about. So what I saw, the people who are really good at this. They're very good at using red herrings. They can just ignore questions and just deflect it. Um, so here's an example. Imagine in that situation, you're a press secretary and somebody says, um, you know, what are you going to do about um, all this violence in schools these days? And then they say, well, that's important, but think about international terrorism, right? They just shift it. I did that very awkwardly, but they somehow, the people who are good at this can, and probably attorneys are very good. Other people, you know, can do this. Uh, here's another red herring down here. Obviously this person on the left, if you can see this small picture, is thinking about the environment, right? We can't worry about the environment. We're in the middle of a war. And see the little red fish, the red herring, right? So it's sort of like, look at the red fish. Don't, don't worry about the environment. Just ignore that. And let's, I want to distract you. So the, probably this uh, I, I can't remember the history of this, but um, it probably comes from something like that where you have this this fish, right? And you're obviously that's what you're going to think about. If I hold up a red herring, you're going to you're going to look at that and you're not going to pay attention. So it's a it's a way of distracting, ignoring and dodging the issue. And again, can you believe politicians would do that? I can't imagine that. <laughs> Sorry, sarcasm. Um, slippery slope. So here winter's coming. Um, imagine, right? And um, you got your sled at the top of the hill, the snow's covering the hill, and you start down, and in the middle, you just stop abruptly. 
That's very unlikely, but it's a very steep or slippery hill. So the idea is this fallacy assumes that once you begin a process, it will go to completion. That's the way I look at it. Slippery slope, right? You're going to slide right down to the bottom and that bottom, you might have heard the expression, I'm going to hell in a handbasket, right? <laughs> or something, or some, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, right? It's everything's going the wrong way and, and we can't avoid it. So an example of this is, this is right from our textbook, by the way, um, handgun controls guarantee that only criminals have guns. So in other words, if we make any laws at all, any restricting the sale or the ownership of handguns, that will ensure that only criminals. So you see how we left out a bunch of steps and also we assume that one thing's gonna to lead to another and it's always gonna get worse and worse. Down here at the bottom, you can see another slippery slope fallacy and it might be a little hard to see this. So let me just read this. They're legalizing marriage between people of the same sex. He says, scratching his head, little stick figure person there. And then we go over next. So notice it jumps to the next thing. So it doesn't just stop. Okay, they're legalizing marriage between the people of the same. It's, it's sort of saying, okay, so something else is gonna happen now. And next they'll allow minors to get married people under 18 will just will be have like 12 year olds will be getting be, be able to be legally getting married next right now there's no reason to think that that would lead to that but this is what the slippery slope is but it's very persuasive because people really will buy into this um soon enough marriage with animals and non-living things will be legalized you can marry your toaster in the future right <laughs> because because you know you see what it so it's like the slippery slope one thing leads to another and eventually marriage will lose its meaning. So we go from here to here and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Notice up here, it says one thing will inevitably, that means there's no, it's, it's definitely going to happen once we do this. So again, this is a fallacy, very persuasive. Don't use it in your writing now, please. Um, Cause it is a fallacy, but it's a great way to persuade and pe people use it a lot, uh, but it's a logical fallacy. And when we think of logical fallacies, we think of breaking the rules. So let's look at a couple of these examples here. And if you'd like to, I want to try to make this again, keep the video as short as possible. We did cover quite a bit with fallacies. It's an important topic. Um, but to do that, I'm going to go through these really quickly. So if you wanted to just, you know, test yourself or quiz yourself here, you could just pause and just decide which of these three would match the examples over here. So we have on this slide, we have non sequitur. Remember non sequitur is that which doesn't follow, meaning, um, Two things are connected, but they're not really. Remember the example we had um, earlier about, um, uh, gosh, let's go back. <laughs> now I've forgotten what example I, oh, that's why I go back. Oh, gosh. Let's see. For some reason, I forgot that one. Oh, yeah, we had the uh, Heather's Married with Started Families. And then we had the example from Elf as well, which is, I really like the movie Elf. It's so funny. I love spaghetti. Let's get some spaghetti. So again, no connection really there, but we make a connection. And that's what um, happens with non sequiturs. The other one's a red herring and that's a distraction. So again, look at this. Don't look at this. We talked about the uh, White House press secretary. Their job a lot of times involves that they have to do that, I think. And then hasty generalizations where we make a conclusion. We talked about racism, sexism. We also talked about just, you know, the idea of Heather's getting. Um... Oh, no, that was the other one. Sorry. That was a non sequitur. Yeah, so a haste generalization, just making a decision too quickly. So again, if you want to pause this real quick, and I'll tell you the answers if you want to try. And if not, I'll just tell you. <laughs> so the first one, he's losing his hair and seems tired. It's about me. So, um, but, it, but you know, okay, some people are losing their hair. They seem tired. It, that could be that they're ill, that they're getting sick, but it might not be. It could just be normal aging process, right? <laughs> so that is a hasty generalization. We need more information. There's not enough information to make that conclusion. We would need to maybe have a doctor's report, uh, testing, CAT scan, whatever, right? We gotta, we gotta get more information, more data. There's not enough data there to make that conclusion. Okay, so number one is a hasty generalization. Number two, many people who live in Seattle drink coffee, the city's near the ocean, and many rock musicians grew up there. Sounds like all interesting things. I'm moving there to get my life back on track. Hmm. Maybe I should have said my career back on track, but you might see that this is interesting. I mean, coffee, uh, the ocean, rock musicians, but is that connected to me getting my life back on track? Seems like a non sequitur, doesn't follow. This is really not connected. In my mind, it might because it sounds good and it'll be fun, I'll have a great time, but is it really gonna get my life back on track? It's probably a non sequitur. Okay, though Exxon has been criticized by many citizen groups for damaging the environment, Yesterday, Eric Westmoreland, head of public relations, announced a new plan to create 5,000 new jobs this year. So again, 
let's look at what we're talking about. They've been criticized for damaging the environment, but their public relations person says we're creating 5,000 new jobs. So it's a red herring because we want to talk about the environment. Exxon, tell us what, what are you doing to, to uh, fix some of these uh, oil spills and clean up some things. And Exxon wants to say, um, well, we're, and this is fictional, by the way, so I probably shouldn't use Exxon. I probably should make up a new oil company name. <laughs> I don't know, because I'm putting this on YouTube. But anyway, it's, it is a, um, not a true story, right? I'm making it up. But it's, it's, um, it's a red herring. They want to distract us. They don't want us to think about the oil spills. They want us to think about the jobs they're creating. All right, a couple more. Again, if you want to read these and pause, we have three choices. Bandwagon, which is everybody's doing it, so you should do it too. Equivocation, which is where we make two things the same when they're really not the same. Uh, or use a word in two different ways, or hasty generalization. As you remember, that's when we need more information. We don't have enough data. Okay, if you did pause it or not, either way, it's obvious she's a communist since she believes healthcare is a right. So we've got these concepts here, communist. And if you look up communist in uh, in the dictionary or on uh, Wikipedia or wherever, uh, it's going to tell you probably something to do with like uh, they believe that uh, or their, their government um, wants um, the state to control and have all, so there's not really like private property basically in a communist society. She believes healthcare is a right. So communism saying all property should be owned and controlled by the government and giving people healthcare benefits, it's not equivalent, right? So that's equivocation. We're making these two concepts the same. We're basically saying she's a communist because she believes healthcare, but that's not really the right definition. It would have to have something about she believes all property should be owned by the state or control. I mean, I think that's probably the definition if we looked it up, but it's a, it's an equivocation. Those are not equal concepts, equal things, but we're making them sound like they're equal. Every real American supports the Citizens Prosperity Act. And so you should urge your senator to vote yes for this bill. Every real American does this. You should do it too, which is bandwagon. Everyone's doing it. You should do it too. Bandwagon. Um, just jump on the wagon. We're having a fun time. Join us. Okay, last last slide. Two more. This is an old one, but strangely familiar. <laughs> this came from the 1970s uh, when the Soviet Union existed, which is now Russia, and the Soviets were involved with Syria, and uh, um, people were arguing that the Americans should support the Syrians. This is way back in the 70s. This is kind of still ongoing. Uh, if America doesn't send weapons to the Syrian rebels, they won't be able to defend themselves against their warring dictator. They'll lose their civil war and the dictator will oppress them. And the Soviets will consequently carve out a sphere of influence that spreads across the entire Middle East. Well, one problem with this is that the Soviet Union doesn't exist. Russia's still there. But, but anyway, this is an old, old example, but it does do one of the things. It says things will inevitably happen. Once we start, like you're at the top of the hill, you're going to slide down. There's no stopping it. So if we don't send weapons... It's all over for the Syrians, for most of the Middle East, it's going to be really messed up if we don't do something. Um, it may have been true, or it may not have been true. I have to look at a history book. But either way, the language they're using here is what's called a slippery slope. One thing will lead to another and another and another. And before you know it, we're gone to hell in a handbasket, like I said earlier. Greenpeace's strategies aren't effective because they are all dirty, lazy hippies. <laughs> That's just insulting. I'm sorry. But I got this out of a book. I didn't make it up. Um, what are we doing there? Are we really talking about Greenpeace's policies, how effective they are, anything, or what they're doing to help the environment? No, we're not disagreeing with any of their policies. We're insulting them personally, which is ad hominem, which means to attack the person or a personal attack. So that's the last one. And that is all of our fallacies. We are going to have a quiz. Our next quiz will definitely have um, fallacies on it. So I'll say more about that um, next week. Hope you have a good week. And as always, let me know if you have any questions.